I believe, has our invocation this morning. Let us pray. May those assembled here today enjoy the many offerings of rotary. May we abide by the rules we have established, those of trust, fellowship, and ethics. And may we place service above self in our daily endeavors. And may we always test ourselves and our efforts to be sure they are the truth, good for all concerned, a benefit to mankind, and provide peace and understanding. Amen. Amen. Let's take the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before we test, one of the things we think, say, or do is the truth. It's a fair law of concern. Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Dad, you want to give us your uh, birthday report? <laughs> Tracy Kempton. They must have been all makeup. All right. One uh, announcement I wanted to uh, I told y'all about Buster last week. He uh, had a got some business, needed a pacemaker, and he. I was going to give you a report today that I thought for Friday he was doing well, but he was supposed to lay low. Not doing anything for two weeks, but Buster's here. I'm doing really well. I'm doing really well. Well, 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 Happy Lewis is happy. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, Buster, I mean, uh, Matthew. Good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning. Just a quick announcement. June 9th, we're going to be at World Beers at 8.30 to do another trash cleanup. We'll go to every quarter. See some red badges in the room. Turn those blue. Nothing else. Well, it will be part of turning the blue. Thank you. Appreciate it, Matthew. Ken? Jeez, what, what, what am I supposed to be reporting? I think, uh, I think you all got gotten a notice about the June 21st change of the guard at the Star Mountain. If you have made a reservation and you did not select an entree, could you please go back on there and let us know what your entree choice is? Okay, so that's what that second email is about. Correct. Uh, we'll check on that. Uh, also, and Steve, Steve's got announcements too. If everybody could real pay close attention to this, because this is us. How many of you have been in a public place and somebody's approaching you? You're you're with a friend or partner or whatever. You're with, and they're approaching you, and you go. Oh my God! I've known this person for years. I don't remember their name. And I've got to make I an never introduction. Liked it, never. <laughs> <laughs> never had that being said, changing of the guard, uh, that sergeant of arms job is is tough. There's a lot going on. A lot of people passing you, and it's so easy one to forget a name. Or if you are new to the club and don't know all the names, somebody passes you by and waves and. Make a point, just for a while, make a point to show your badge. It's, you may have done it a dozen times. Keep doing it. Uh, it really helps that individual. Thank you. That being said, Lisa, let's talk about our who we have today. I only have three meetings left, and I still can't get this order. <laughs> Good morning. We have 36 Rectarians and um, four guests. Three guests, I believe, with um, United Way. And then Mr. Dodd, Billy Dodd's um, father. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, and breakfast will be coming up. Minutes, five minutes. Good deal. So I guess we got time for one more game here. Um, <laughs> how about Brother Hughes? Table. All right, let's go back. Did I hear something? No. I'm just, just kidding. I was just making sure. <laughs> 
Leave us alone. We've got a big family. We're too small of a family this week. We lost some kids. Yeah, I get picked on too much. We always got a small family. Can you follow? All right. Let's do the Lisa Simpson back here.
can't use too much anyway. I've got uh, two happy dollars, uh, both related to Jeff. Jeff wrote an article, or the magazine had an article about my daughter. It was really about the team of Kaiser. They went undefeated, won their conference and the tournament and everything. But um, my daughter Kate got interviewed, and then she turned around and interviewed the coach, and both articles oh, were in the thing. So it was real nice. Thanks a lot. Uh, basketball. But uh, I'll be introducing Michelle Gathers Clark, who's the president and CEO of the United Way of Greater Greensboro, in just a minute. But I want to tell you, we have, she has, as you know, two guests or two uh, new employees with her as guests. Kim Varner, who is uh, a staff accountant. Mm -hmm. uh, Varner, I'm sorry. That's staff why I accountant. Get that a lot. <laughs> and Lauren Forbes, who's the, the manager of communications <coughs> and marketing. So let me introduce before, until the food comes out, and we'll just play this by ear. Michelle, uh, uh, oh, I think Tony yeah. oh, so okay. everything's out except for potatoes and um, uh, biscuits. Those are the two things we're waiting on. They should be out in about four minutes. So if, you, if anyone wants to start and doesn't want those things, then it's up to each other. Okay. Why don't we go ahead and start the line? And as as the line starts, as you all start to settle down, I'll pop back up. I'll introduce Michelle, and then we'll start. Well, go ahead and. Get in line and uh, we'll start the chow line. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
Success Center, I think, is so fascinating and so important to our community on many levels. I'm just appreciative that Michelle has agreed to come and tell us about it. I hope you'll find it as interesting as I did and can see how it plugs in and truly benefits our entire community. Michelle, thank you for coming and joining us today. And you all just, I know we're doing things a little bit out of order. If you need coffee, I'm sure she does mind if you go get coffee or something for some more breakfast. Thank you. Get this. And so, as you're munching, I'd like two or three people to tell me, if I gave you 31% more of something, Mike, what would you like for me to give you? 31% more. What would you like? Would you like some money? Okay, well, he wants 31% more money. Somebody? Somebody says socks. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Socks, thank you. If I could give you just in 31% more of something, what would you like? Free time. Free time. Judy, 
Thirty-one percent more of something. Huh? I was going to say time. Time. The reason why I'm here today is because the poverty rate in our great city is thirty-one percent higher than the national average. And quite frankly. I came to the United Way because I find that statistic unacceptable. We're actually better than that. But in fact, 57,000 people in our great city struggle to have breakfast for everyone in the household before they go to school and work. They struggle with paying for food or utilities. They struggle with affordable rent in a decent place that does not have mice and other undesirables. So the reality is, as a city, it is not about poking the fire. It is about all of us understanding the statistic and what we can do about it. Our city has some extraordinary assets that it is very important that we bring together to boldly say we want to end generational poverty. Why generational poverty? Because the reality is, is if you teach a child how to read and send them home to chaos, all of that learning unravels. And likewise, if you give parents employment without childcare, they cannot focus on work because they're concerned about their children. And I see some nodding of heads because that's a common sense thing, Michelle. And yet, we will give people a bag of food and think that that is going to satisfy their needs. A bag of food is excellent when someone is hungry, but it does not solve hunger. It simply feeds them for a day. And so in many ways, I am here to share how we want to feed a man for a day, but we also want to teach him how to fish to feed him for a lifetime. And that's what Your United Way is focused on. Your United Way of Greater Greensboro is suggesting that the ecosystem needs to be more collaborative. And we need to hold out the statistic that we're trying to reduce and defeat. And so the statistic you all know is what? 31. That's right. It is unacceptable for us to be 31% higher than the national average. And that translates into one in four children living in a household where their basic needs cannot be met. 25% of our children and 20% of our <coughs> adults. And 70% of these households actually work every day. I don't know which one that Okay. So what I want to share with you is a framework that we are using at the United Way that says it is our strategic desire to end generational poverty. And we're so crazy at United Way, we believe that we can be the first southeastern city to actually significantly reduce generational poverty to the point that it is eradicated. And I did that because I push all those buttons. So we've got a framework for how we get things done. And, I'm, and I, I just wanted you to kind of see the why more so than anything else. And then I want to share a body of work that's going on in our city. Um, so for us, we work with households, not individuals. Because imagine that you only have one person in a household. So we believe we've got to help the whole family. We also believe we've got to make sure that pre-birth all the way to seniors are served. 
we have a lot of seniors in our community who are not visited and who do not have family. And so we've got to make sure they get meals and all the things that they need to be successful. And likewise, we have young children who do not have the support systems that they need. So I want to show you, if a picture is, oops, if a picture is worth a thousand words, I want to share with you how and what we're doing. Three years ago, on March 26, 2015, we embarked on a body of work called the Family Success Center. And we went around the nation to look at models in other cities and said, given your poverty issue in San Francisco, in Chicago, in New York City, in Salt Lake City, in Winston-Salem, what are you doing? that is working and what have you done that did not work? We came back together, we came back to Greensboro and we created a Frankenstein of sorts and said, let's take the component pieces from around the nation that will make sense in Greensboro. And it wound up being the Family Success Center. But there are four things that we learned in our journey. You must deal with two generations at a time. You've got to deal with children and their parents and caregivers. One. Two, nonprofits have to talk to each other and share information about the people they serve. We cannot operate in silos that says, I know that mama has diabetes, but I'm going to ignore that fact, even though I know she gets flare-ups and is not feeding her child. You can't ignore those facts. You've got to say, what is it that we can do? So we've got to deal with two generations at a time. We also know, and as businessmen and women, we know that when you see that there is a problem, you put the solution close to the problem. So if this roof started leaking, would we put the pail over there if the leak is over here? No, we would put the pail under the leak. So we actually do nonprofit servicing in communities where people who need the service don't live. So what we said is let's move the service into the neighborhoods with the highest poverty so that they can walk to success so they can push a stroller to success. And they can start to see that there's investment being made in their neighborhoods. <clears throat> and last and certainly not least, we have to deliver services in a bundled way. People who are hungry, do you think they're just hungry? <clears throat> what else do you think might be going on with someone who's hungry? Audience participation time. Anxious, right? Stress, health, uh, probably unhealthy. What else? Jobless. So you see, we gotta kind of not treat the iceberg above the waterline. We gotta go under the waterline and say, so the Rotary is focused on hunger. I think that's the right thing. But why are people hungry? Because they don't have money. Because if they had money, they would go to that place called the grocery store just like we do. Right? So the reality is we've got to say to people when they come for a bag of food, are you connected with work supports? Do you have a job and are you in the market? No, let me connect you to work supports. And the second and important question is, are you connected with food supports called food stamps? And if not, let's go online and check your eligibility and get you that. Because then we help people become upwardly mobile. And everyone in America, <laughs> deserves the opportunity to be upwardly mobile, economically and socially. You see, we believe that most people who are receiving services don't work. 70% of the people on welfare go to work every day. 
the challenge they have is that their wages are low because their skills are low and their educational attainment is low. Danny, you got up and talked about your young man going to school. He is going to school to be self-sufficient and get off your payroll. <laughs> right? And many people don't have that opportunity. And so this great city, you as businessmen and women and Rotarians, I know that's where your heart is. And it's really an investment in heart. Because you see, it's so much easier for me to give someone a bag of food than it is to deal with a model called the Family Success Center. And the hard work is important. So the hard work for us is we moved into the neighborhood. We're on Arlington Street. We're in zip code 27406. There are four zip codes that have poverty that is actually higher than 25%. It is more like 30% because poverty concentrates itself. Zip codes 27401, 27403, 27405, 27406. Statistically soaring poverty rates in our great city. It is an economic issue. It is not a moral issue. Because new businesses don't move to cities where there is high poverty and the workforce is shrinking. They move to where the workforce is growing. And in America, the more diverse our workforce is, and I don't mean by color of skin, I mean by social economic level. Everyone should participate in the ecosystem. So we moved into zip code 27406 and we went to the place where we knew children and mothers and fathers were, and that's in federally funded Head Start. We know that everybody there lives below the poverty line and needs help. Then we went and said, Goodwill, GTCC, Step Up, a t UNCG, and Cone Health, come to this place in the neighborhood and let's get people their GED as a pathway to community college so that they can get some skills. a t and UNCG, you're educating all those counselors. There is mental health associated with being poor. It's called stress. If I took away all your money and your house, you'd be stressed. <laughs> <laughs> he said more than stress. <laughs> so the reality is, is we've got to meet people where they are. Goodwill does an extraordinary job of job training. So you see what we did? We took the assets. There was no need for United Way to say, let's start a new job training program. Go and get the people who do it well. We don't need a new GED program. GTCC does it fabulously. Then we said, what other programs do we need? We need jobs. How many people in here are in a role where they hire people? Raise your hand. So the reality is we have to be talking to corporations like Lincoln Financial who said, you know what, we want a diverse workforce and we're going to start moving into neighborhoods and helping people who are just getting their GED, who are smart, industrious, willing to work. We're going to help them become part of the Lincoln family. And they've been hiring people, so has Lowe's, Home Depot, and a, we have more than 35 employers. Today, I need you to, to know about the Family Success Center to the degree that you say, you know what, HR, go over there and see what that crazy lady Michelle is talking about. <laughs> go over there and see what the opportunity is for us to decrease from 31% above the national average and get closer to the national average and then one day be below the national average. So this secondary circle, supporting services, some adults are functionally illiterate. 
So they can't come and work for you just yet. So we've got reading connections on board. We have families who've never had a bank account. We've got to teach them how to be banked. We've got to tell people check cashing places and title loan companies are not your friend. <laughs> so we have to teach people that because people don't understand the banking system. If mommy and daddy never participated in it, then the son and daughter don't participate in it. So there are a number of supporting services we put around that. And then we've got the referral services, right? Some people need the support of Wellsprings because Nana is in the house and she keeps calling me at work so I can't keep a job. Well, Nana needs to go over to Wellsprings during the day and be entertained with the other people that are in her age group, et cetera. Or you look at the YWCA, where some people need after school care, or the Y, or Salvation Army, Boys and Girls Club. So it is really about bringing the assets together to form a solution that addresses the four pillars of economic and social mobility. And how do we know about those four pillars? Because Howard, those four pillars worked well for you. And it's called education, financial literacy, being prepared to work, and being healthy. And that's what we offer people who right now, families of four, making less than $24,850. You cannot make it in Greensboro, North Carolina as a family of four making less than, and often our families make less than $20,000 a year. And they work, and they work hard. You cannot take care of a family of four working in fast food. I am not against fast food. Food. I am not talking about anybody's job. I'm just saying that a family of four cannot survive on a fast food job. And we know this intellectually, and now it's about accountability. I was saying to Judy, I don't ask people, um, I don't come to these. When people see United Way, they start holding their wallet in their pocket and say, oh my God, the shakedown. <laughs> I need something far bigger than that. Judy ran when I said that. <laughs> Judy, you still here? No. Okay, just check. Um, I actually need your intellectual capital. You see, your United Way cannot actually solve the problem of generational poverty alone. We can only do this when this city bands together and says, this has got to stop. We have the power. It's not about government coming in and intervening. It's about those of you who raised your hand to say, would I give a girl like Michelle a job? You see, because Michelle wasn't born a senior vice president, and Michelle was not born the CEO of anything except her life. Michelle was born into public housing in New York City, a girl who lived below the poverty line because my parents left the segregated South and moved to New York City for civil servant jobs and to climb that ladder. But they told me I had to go to college and that we would break the cycle of poverty. Not everybody has the benefit that I had of two parents who said, we don't know what college is, but we do know that people who go to college seem to do well. And we want, they wanted their kids to do well. But somebody gave me a chance over and over and over again. So I became socially and economically mobile. So the families I'm asking you to think about when the next open job comes, you see, they're the reincarnation of Michelle <coughs> five years ago, you know, just a little while ago. <laughs> um, so great things are possible when a community decides to invest. And that's what I'm looking for today, an investment from this community. And so I have three favors as I wrap up. Ready? Yeah, yeah. Ready. <laughs> OK, favor number one. Would you tell five friends something you heard today 
that you think is worth your friends knowing? How many people will do that for me? Raise your hand. Sure. Okay, good. Cool. <laughs> Two. I would like you to come see the Family Success Center. We have a tour once a month because it's important for people to visualize a solution. I don't want you to believe anything that I say. I want you to come because when you come, you get to talk to people that were serving. You get to kick the tires. So if I could, could I please send Chip for Ralph or whomever you tell me an email that shares, like I don't want your emails, I, and that shares the dates of the tours. Would you please consider coming and or coming with a colleague or sending a colleague? Raise your hand if you do that for me. I love you all. <laughs> and three, and certainly not least, can I ask you to go on Google or anything that is appropriate and ask you to go <coughs> and learn something new about poverty? and about what's going on and the latest research and kind of what we're learning about this topic. Because I think an informed investor is really important because you wouldn't give your money, and I didn't ask you for any, to someone without checking them out. So I don't want you to give your time without checking out the issue. So would you do that for me by show of hands? Will people go and learn just one new thing about poverty? Okay, I love you all. <laughs> so now, questions? I have a comment, something that I learned, and you have made, maybe you've heard this too. I don't know if it came from a sociologist or a certain study, but by the time children are in third grade, social workers, sociologists, and the sheriff's department are starting to budget future jail capacity based on third grade reading levels. Can, can you uh, comment a little bit on yeah. that? So the reality is, is um, uh, we statistically prepare for how many people in America we will incarcerate. Uh, we have mass incarceration here, and we have stigmatized being poor and illiterate. And so there is a statistical analysis that suggests that a child who cannot read at his grade level, by the time he is eight years old is likely to be incarcerated in our country. Now, instead of us saying, maybe we should spend that money teaching him how to read, we instead prepare a jail bed for them in this great country. <clears throat> I would say that's not a good economic model. It's not very sustainable, number one. Number two, something I found out about the Family Success Center, I just thought, this is a great aha moment. So mothers with young children, they need someone, you know, they can't leave the house because they have to take care of the children. But at the Family Success Center, there is care for the young yeah. children. So we have, what, yeah. what I was going to say about that is one thing that's especially important, I think, is these children are seeing something modeled for them. They're seeing mom pursuing an education. That sets a tremendous uh, precedent, a tremendous uh, uh, role model for them to follow. And then also be part of the unsustainability of just building more jail cells. Yeah. The reality, if we ask ourselves a common sense question, not a moral question, common sense, what do you think the number one reason a girl drops out of high school? Number one reason. Right. 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 So what do you think she needs after she finishes after she has the baby? So she can what? Finish school. Do you know there guess how many child care and GED programs in the same location there are in Greensboro, North Carolina? One. Where is it? Family Success Center. So look, I'm no genius. <laughs> But I said, how the heck you going to have a GED program with no child care and say nothing? So we put it in. Uno. Uno. That's ridiculous. Yeah. So you see now why I need your intellectual capacity to say to people, come on now. Let's stop the definition of insanity. <laughs> okay? It's not a moral issue. <clears throat> 
it is just a common sense solution to our reality. Educated women make different decisions about rape, starting a family. Let's get people educated. Questions? Yes? You talked about how important it was for your parents to uh, show you the value of staying in school and doing well in school and, and going on. Do you have programs that help coach parents into? <laughs> the answer is yes. We are coaching parents by first meeting them where they are, and sometimes that's in illiter illiteracy, and teaching them how to read, and then requiring them to read to their children in front of us and showing them how to read. Because you know what? Most people will tell a child, sit down so I can read to you. That's not how you teach children how to read. It has to be in contact. That child has to be on your lap, turning pages, feeling the book, respecting the book. And unfortunately, if you're not taught that, you just don't know. And so we are teaching parents, and we have parenting classes, to say that you can't spank your way to success. <laughs> Right? You gotta kind of figure out how to talk to people and talk to each other and take away some of the toxic stress that's in your house because of economics. You gotta create some social capital in your home by how you have relationships with people. So yeah, we'll go into the root of it and that's why we have the colleges and universities in there with their counselors. <laughs>